can you tell me how you got uh, into science fiction and fantasy? Okay. Well, I was reading them as a kid. Uh, I used to... Okay, first of all, I grew up near the local library. So I basically read everything. Like, um, you know, we the, the, the local library was next door. So I basically grew up there. You know, my parents would drop us there before they went out and pick us up there in the evening. So you know we books basically were our babysitters so before long we had read all the books in the library so and the ones that stuck with me the most were science fiction fantasy well mainly fantasy because they had the most wonder for a child you know and uh yeah i i, I would say they really helped at developing minds so from then on we moved on to buying secondhand fancy novels wait, from... wait, hold on just let's go a second before I, because you know i also go next to a library and i also read okay. all the books for kids in the library uh, mm -hmm. but uh i the reason i did that because was because i had parents who got me to do that uh, okay did, you, did your parents like what did your parents do? Why did they look at this? Uh, well, it, it wasn't. It wasn't as much of a request, as much of as much as it was just. They didn't really say anything. It was just like a safe place to be. You know, there's the library. There's a librarian that ensures everything is in order. So you can't play around. You can't get hot in the library because there's just books. You know, it was more like a place for safekeeping it just also turned out that incidentally um, they were also safekeeping our minds or helping our minds grow so there were only so many books a local library is going to have so at a certain point before long we had read all the books and then i mean one of my brothers after reading all the books moved on to all the novels moved on to non-fiction books and then after reading all the non-fiction books, moved on to textbooks. He even read the encyclopedias that we had then, cover to cover, like volume one to ten. I mean, I stopped at novels, so, yeah. So, yeah. Who did you like the most? Like, which authors did you like the most? Uh, C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. I mean, for... Yeah, for a young child at the time, Aslan, Nanya, those were kind of irresistible. Yeah. Then there was um uh th there's this set of books, uh Animal Adventure, uh Tiger Adventure. I can't remember the title of the series, but yeah, if I look it up, yeah, there were a series of books about um adventurers. Um, I can't remember the title, but yeah, aside um, fancy, I grew into a lot of historical fiction, which was also present at the time. Uh, yeah. Okay. And did you start like, yeah. uh, did you show, uh, did you start writing or imagining stories yourself at a young age? Yes. Pretty much. I mean, it, it sort of goes with the territory. You know, you know how they say, um, it's, it's Chino Achebe who said, if you don't like a story, then write your own. You know, a, a bunch of the stories will get you dissatisfied, you know. Mm -hmm. So you start thinking, how could this have been better? And by thinking like that, you're already unwittingly writing your own stories, you know sort of creating an alternate ending so yeah that's where it started and what is the next stage in creating in, in, in your origin story yeah okay well um well from from changing alternate um from discussing alternate endings it moves to writing my own versions of the story you know Fan fiction, essentially, you know, taking a character and saying, okay, what if we did this with this character instead, 
you know, what if Sherlock Holmes got married? What if he had a kid? What would this kid be like? You know, or what if um, this um, this Dark Lord's acolyte decided to, you know, fight for the good guys instead? You know, so yeah, it's, it 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 um it it evolved into writing fan fiction, you know, my own versions of stories, then eventually uh writing my own stories or trying to okay and when did you did you know you want to be an author did you ever know you want to be an author uh well i i, I would exactly say i knew it was more like i tried it was sort of like um an assignment you know during one of those moments where I was having a discussion about one of the stories with one of my siblings. I think they were fed up. I don't know if they were fed up or if it was a deliberate um, attempt to help me develop myself as a writer. But I first got this suggestion from one of my siblings who said, instead of trying to, you know, um edit or rework someone's story why not write your own and then he said sit down and give me a story right now write me a short story and i i would sit down for the rest of the night and be unable to produce anything you know it was it was a woeful failure my first attempt and i would think about it constantly for the next several months you know um you know I've, i've read so many stories i just why couldn't i develop a coherent plot you know i was um you know as happens with a lot of people that read um you have a wide vocabulary spelling skills your diction is generally you know good so I was one of the best student, English students in my class so it, it, it always worried me that I couldn't you know and eventually um, with more constant trials I would eventually manage to come up with you know something so that was how it all started. So how did you then become an author? Like, let's skip to the part where you're an author. Like, how did that happen? Where you write? Deciding or being able to write my own stories was a very, very long way away from actually trying and succeeding or even wanting to be a professional author, you know, because there's, um, there's this thing There's this gap between writing as a profession, as a career, and writing as a hobby. You know, I was writing at the time as a kid, you know, in my, you know, maybe even before I was 10 and in my early teens. But, you know, it, it wasn't really with any serious goal to get published because they just weren't avenues. To get published in the climb I was in at the time you know I don't know if you remember I mentioned we were buying secondhand books because we couldn't even get new books to buy you know in Nigeria at the time yeah new fancy novels from foreign authors and when we could get them to buy they were extremely expensive so it was mainly our reading mainly, mainly consisted of books published locally or um, books that had oversaturated Western markets so much so that they were shipped down as um, secondhand and sold at secondhand value, you know? So reading was, was an issue, much less writing, you know? Yes. So publishing just wasn't an option. There were... Uh, self-publishing yeah self-publishing wasn't viable then because amazon and all these other models were in there so it was a case of you you, you either got into one of the major publishers 
the big five traditional publishers or uh, you basically ran your own printing press, which was very capital intensive. And I mean, not something people who could barely buy books you know, when, when people can barely that, buy so, books, you can't be... Which was the issue. When yeah. people can barely buy books, you can't make a living as an author anyway, right? Exactly, exactly. When people around you cannot afford, you know, the kind of, yeah. So, and of course, a lot of the local authors were not highly successful because they didn't have very wide range of distribution and you know their books were in global so yeah um which i suppose was one of the things that slowed um or that impacted yeah the development of the late development of african literature you know i don't think it wasn't just an Andrean problem it was a continental problem because you know uh we're dealing with a lot of issues, commercial, you know, um, um, financial and, you know, economical, you know, so, yeah, it, it wasn't very viable. In fact, for most of my, I, I started professionally trying to write maybe less than half a decade ago, okay. you know, so I, yeah, I didn't really write for most of my life. I just really harbored the idea. It was like a distant dream. You know, people talk about their writing dreams coming true. Like, oh, I always wanted to publish here on tour. I always wanted to win this award. I always wanted to... The truth is, you know, a lot of the publishing um, goals I've achieved are goals that I didn't even have. They were dreams that I didn't even dare to have, you know. So when people talk about achieving, we didn't even dream those things. Yeah. You know, it's like winning the lottery, the grand prize lottery, or being struck by lightning. It's not something anybody really plans for, yeah. or really, you know, yeah. So, I mean, basically until the advent of um, the internet, you know, um, literary magazines. So then I have this conversation with someone who tells me, oh, you can submit to magazines. You know, the, 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 there's a short fiction mod model right now where you get enough um, publishing credits in um, prestigious magazines, maybe Asimov, Clark Twombo, The New Yorker, and, you know, you get nominated for a number of awards and you're out there in the genre as one of the writers to watch for. Then maybe you get, you know, headhunted by agents or you pitch agents who now know, you know, you know, back then we didn't have all that. So we basically had to wait for the world to develop to a stage where, you know, we could manage uh, a window into the industry. Yeah. And even now, it's just a window. You know, it's not the whole door. Even systems such as self-publishing that are meant to cater to, you know, the crowd of people that cannot get in through the door. You know, it's only partially open for us. It's, it's kind of like this. The door is the main pathway but people can't get in through the door a small portion people who can't get in through the door they go in through the window now the window is blockaded so there's even only a small part of the window for people from certain parts of the world to get into you know so it's like a fraction of a fraction of a fraction you know a very extreme kind of marginalization you know, for example, I, I'll explain a bit what I mean. You're probably wondering what, what, what am I saying? For example, you know, I'm talking about self-publishing. It's not even accessible to writers on the African continent, mostly. For example, PayPal is banned in Nigeria. 
Okay. Because for some reason, yeah, the operators of PayPal believe that a whole country of 200 million are entirely fraud stars. I don't know how that, how someone can think that's possible. It's an entirely racist idea, you know. So PayPal doesn't work. And that's the broadest payment method for most of these um, platforms. Amazon, um, Publishizer, you mentioned it. They basically all use PayPal. So we're basically cut off. You know, they, of course, they work, there's there's a lot of work around, but the works around themselves are tedious. Yeah, there's, there's a way around, but the way around ends up not working because most people quit before they find their way there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it basically achieves the goal of, you know, of blockading people. So... So yeah. there's a kind of a financial blockade around Nigeria, for example, because the thing yes, thing. financial, not just yeah, yeah, yes. And are there any yeah. other uh, hindrances to self-publishing or publishing in uh, Nigeria? Yes, that's one of them, which I just mentioned, the PayPal thing. There's also the fact that. Um, a lot of platforms don't they don't have you know they don't have viable options or payment systems for people here you know for example um, some of them require that you have a US account you know so there's a bunch of um, apps now that mimic um us accounts that allow you to use but it's it's usually involves a whole bunch of financial gymnastics to navigate you know which is more tedious than it's worth some of the time you know and then there's also um economic factors over here because um most of the countries in africa are what you call what they call developing countries. So, you know, there's um, there's the financial angle to everything, you know. Um, so how, how did you get so, around yeah. that? <laughs> you have books out, you have stories out. Okay. Book out, you know. How did you get around that? Okay. It's a it's a whole it, it's 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 a whole obstacle course to navigate, you know. First of all, getting paid for your stories require you knowing people in the US who can use PayPal. So mm-hmm. I get I, I can get a proxy. To receive the money from me for a story, then send the money to me through, you know, an alternate method that works, like um, that works in quotes. You know, see, see, the problem is there's a lot of these supposedly alternate methods like um, Western Union, you know, but they work on and off, you know. So, and it's usually a lot of work for an editor to navigate. Because the editor is busy and they have a lot of writers to pay, they have editing to do. So it, it, it it's usually discouraging. And I would say it affects it it even affects the way that writers on the continent um, get to work with publications outside. You know, because if a publication can't pay you, then, you know, that's a problem. So basically, it involves um, using proxies, uh, using alternate payment systems that are very problematic. Uh, yeah. For example, a lot of, there's also 
there's a, there's a lot of um, inconveniences with paying writers because even um, banks in the US sometimes refuse to send money to Nigeria altogether. Oh. You know, even when the editor is willing to, yes. You know, they try to convince the editor that they're being swindled or, you know. So, yeah, there's, there's all this, um, there's all these issues. Well, can I, I tell mean, you? I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a whole nother area. I'm only talking about the technical barriers. There's language barriers, language and culture. You know, there's this whole disconnect between um, writers writing from the continent and editors and publishers in the West. You know, you know how we talk about, yeah, your culture is in your language. You know, you, 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 your, your, your identity is in your language. You know, for example, if I've, if I've, if I've grown up in a place where banana trees are tall, you know, and in the US, banana trees are short. If my prose were to say, for example, if I were to have a sentence that says, as tall as a banana tree, in my work, it would technically be correct for me. Mm -hmm. You understand? But it would be wrong for the US editor. Now, that's just one sentence, but you see, your entire body of work is riddled with thousands of, you know, that kind of thing. So there's a disconnect. Yeah. And, you know, diversity, yeah, diversity isn't a big thing. There are not many, um, there are not many people from um, uh, marginalized communities at the helm or at the seat in all these organizations. So, mm-hmm. It's it's uh, it's difficult for you know for there to be a space, or for this, you know, f- f- for writers writing from all these places that we are to come across as coherent, you know. So yeah, that's that's one of these. So when when you mix all these things, language, cultural barriers with the technical issues you know, with the economic condition of things, you know, because you're writing from a place where, a place that we call developing, you know, our currency is lower, you know, you're purchasing, um, you're buying from a lower economy, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, the combination of all these factors just makes it very difficult for, you know, writers from this climb to be seen. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, you know, I, I spoke to a few uh, Spanish uh, authors and some of the stories uh, are in this podcast uh, really would be hard to understand for an American audience or a British audience because the society is different and they don't expect the audience to be American. I was just present at uh, a launching of a book of Israeli science fiction. And some of those stories, not published here, would never be able to translate because they quote so many things that are inside the... Um, the culture, which no one else knows about, except people who live. Here. Yes, yeah, exactly. And when I was, I can tell you what it was like in the nineties, not in Nigeria, but in Israel, to try to be a science fiction author. Uh, you know, I think money transfers was okay, but to be able to send a story, you had to send a self-addressed stamped envelope. You had to buy instead of. Um, Instead of stamps, you had to, yeah. you couldn't email. You had to find international reply coupons because they wouldn't accept email submissions, uh, the big uh, magazines, which are like seven times more expensive yeah. stamps. And you didn't have one. You were young and, uh, and wanted yeah, to I'm, be a writer. And it would take yeah. weeks to go back, weeks to go. Yeah. 
and it was um, no see that see the scenario is just pasted yeah i mean there's even an email option it, it basically means in the era before emails this whole segment of people were cut off all together yes you know now nigeria doesn't even have an e an effective um, uh, mailing system for physical mail. So, yeah. you know, where you're talking about, it takes weeks to go in and come back. Here, it will take years. Wow. You know, so, yeah. It's crazy. You, don't, you have a very poor mailing system. Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, okay. So, how did you break through? So, like, here now, you have, like... How did you break through? How did you, how were you able to begin to be? Confident? Yeah. Okay. I have a, um, I would say I'm a social animal. I was essentially a hype man for a rap artist before, you know, I started pushing my career. So I, I have, I've had a lot of experience with forcing my way into i mean we literally had to force our way into shows we weren't invited into perform mm -hmm. you know so yeah in in rap, rap music involves a lot of aggressive promotion because that's the you know that that's the message in rap you know we're aggressive or bold you know so i'm coming to i basically came to literature with all of that energy you know, the energy of a hype man, you know, um, um, I made a lot of friends. I interacted with a lot of people in the U.S., uh, you know, in different parts of the West. So I, I basically, my first anthology was with Zelda Knight, who is in the U.S. So, uh, yeah, I basically got to publish through her. You know, she's the one handling the publishing. So she has the, you know, she, yeah, she has the structure to get it done. You know, so yeah, basically I was able to walk through people, you know, but that's that's not the kind of, um, it requires a humongous amount of energy and effort that the average writer is not expected to have you know and shouldn't have if, even as a matter of fact it takes its toll on me it's in it's even incompatible with the industry having to force you know yourself that strongly to be visible you know it, it makes you come off as um i don't know it, it puts people off some of the time you know you seem to strong-headed or rude you know but it's the only way for you to break through so you're faced with the choice of either staying on scene being not in nobody or being obnoxious you know it's the those are your choices i mean and that's even for the few for the limited number of people that can be that way because most writers aren't built like that writers are you know the, the very the very traits that serve to make you a writer you know being solitary being able to you know reading is a solitary activity you know reading isn't a crowd thing you're reading alone even when you're reading in a crowd you're alone you know you, 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 you're getting the images by yourself. You're visualizing them by... It's not like, it, it, it's not like TV or film where two dozen people, hundreds of people could be getting the same image. You know, everybody gets the image of literature in their own head, in the way that they perceive. So writers are built to be solitary by the very act of reading. Now... You're in a system that requires you to be the exact opposite of how it's built you to be. Aggressive, loud, obnoxious, you know. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not something that many people can do. 
and it comes with very high costs, even for those that can, you know. So, yeah. So how did you break, how were you able to break through? Yeah, by, by being obnoxious, by insisting on being seen, by share to editors uh, in, in the web did you meet them personally did you like yes i was everywhere i was submitting to literally every magazine that existed i was shooting my works out to as much as 200 publishers a year you know mm -hmm. i was um, i was on all social media apps trying to interact with everybody trying to build connections, see who I could work with, who was willing to help me do a transfer, who was willing to, you know, yeah, so, yeah, basically. Yeah, that's, that's tough. And do you think your name was also a problem? Like, it's obviously not an American name, for example. You know? It's uh, a huge problem. Yeah. You know, a lot of the time, I've considered changing my name to something easy, you know, because there's, there's a psychology to how, you know, um, people interact, you know, it's kind of like, there's this, there's this attitude that the, that Western readers have, you know, that is, um, fostered by the attitude of editors and um, publishers, you know, they sort of handle their readers with kid gloves, you know. Mm -hmm. For example, um, when we grew up reading, you know, Nandra was colonized by, you know, the British, I mean, there was slavery, then there was colonialism. So there's a lot of Western influences on the continent. Now, those things are foreign. You know, they are alien, but we had to accept them. We had to imbibe them, you know. If I'm reading a novel by Charles Dickens, a good lot of what I'm reading is going to be strange because it's not my culture. You know, but we, we learned to basically, you know, sift or get these things by um, context. You know, that, but that, that's something that doesn't happen a lot in, you know, in literature, you know, that is in the West. Even when African writers, even when people from um, marginalized societies are published, you know, it, it, it's, there's a lot of um, demand for the work to be palatable. You know, your words have to be italicized. Certain ideas have to be explained, you know. So there's this need to spoon feed the, 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 the Western reader, to have them in diapers and, you know, mash their food for them, you know, so... It's it's um yeah it it's 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 definitely created a problem. But I I think that if um readers were more open minded, you know, you don't you don't have to understand every detail of a story, you know, to to consume it. You know, there's, there's, there's parts of it that you can imbibe or that you can get through context. So, can, can you, did, did I get it? Can you rephrase, can you repeat the question? No, forget, forget my question for a second because I have a question about what you said. You, I'll ask my question again in a second. What, okay. You're absolutely right. How much of your writing today is on the one hand, it's the thing you want to write, but on the other hand, how much contextualizing do you have to do 
knowing an international audience is reading? How much explaining do you have to do? Or how are you maybe writing it in a way that you make sure that those people understand it also? You know? Okay. Yeah. At this point, mm, my, con my contextualizing is all subconscious. You know, I'm at, at this point, at this point, if I'm pondering or trying to make my work more palatable, you know, or make or explain or make it uh, you know, it's entirely incidental without my knowing. Because I'm at a place where I'm very comfortable with myself, with my culture, with my work, with who I am, mm. that I do not particularly care who understands, who can understand me. If you can't make the leap, then well, too bad. And yeah, it 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 does affect our work, you know. We see a lot of our reviews, you get a lot of bad reviews. Where the, it's obvious that the reader is just being lazy. You know, you say you can't get the mannerism of a character or you don't understand the, uh, the speech patterns or, you know, and, yeah, you know, that, you, you that, put it out to bad review. writing. That was in a review. Got... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's just, that's just lazy reading. Yeah. You know, because I read, I read and I watch cowboy stories. You know, and the the, the 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 a lot of a lot of the lingo, you know, it's not plain or straight, but it's something that you know. There's this way that the world centers the West, where you know, it's 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 considered um, something that everybody has to accept. You know, but I think it should be a two-way street you know so i i really um now now the, the thing is i'm going to say something you know we grew we grew up reading a lot of western literature you know so we we all when we you, there's something stephen king said and <laughs> It's ironical. I'm proving my point by giving by using this quote because I'm more I'm I'm more conversant with Stephen King's quotes than you know. But he said um, imitation precedes creation. You know, so you end up imitating the styles, you know, that you imbibe very early on, you know, and it's from there that you develop your own unique style. So a lot of the works that we grew up on were Western. So the, the average African might be right, might have been writing with a Western, um, from a Western place, you know. That's why, that's why when you talk about, um, when people talk about appropriation, you know, we, we, we can't really, Anyway, that's another that's another whole thing. But but the point is that our cultures were largely erased. You know, it's something that happens with colonialism, and so our literature had a Western, um, you know, tilt. So we had to basically exercise or make conscious effort to write from our own point of view. It required us to make conscious effort to tell our own stories, you know, so, and um, it, it's, it's taking a while. It's something that I probably will continue doing until the day that I die. You know, there's probably always going to be Western influences, you know, because it's something that has been forced bread for centuries so you know when i when i when i started writing when i think of a protagonist you know the image that comes to my head is a, you know is a white guy you know because that's the classic protagonist that we're fed right. it, it, a young teenage chosen one 
kind of straight guy. You know, he's not queer. He's not black. It's not a woman who is middle-aged, you know, so and all those are yeah exactly those are things that we have to consciously work out of ourselves so now that we are aware of all those things there's a conscious need maybe even aggressive need to decolonize our literature so that's that's why i said if i'm writing right now i'm not i I don't really care about spoon feeding anybody or making anything palatable able to i'm just interested in telling my stories and recovering all the lost time all the stolen moments that you know i've had to do without that mm-hmm. okay well yeah. um so back to my original question mm-hmm. how how did you where did your first uh, story get published uh in cause yeah, Cosmic Roots and LG Shores. Are you, you're talking about paid, right? Uh, paid and not paid, actually. Both of them. Okay, uh, well, I mean, if you say not paid, then that could be practically anywhere because I published in blogs, on social media, you know, so it's okay. really hard to say where, yeah. But my first professional sale, my first sale, being paid for a story at all was in Cosmic Root and Eldritch Shores. Yeah, it's an SFWA pro rates pain magazine. So, yeah. Hmm. Okay. I, you know, I remember as an author, it was really hard to get published. And in yeah. the beginning, we had uh, easings, but just starting to happen. And it really was like like a domino thing. My the first story that was published was something that didn't pay. They even forgot to tell me they accepted the, the, the story and that it was published. Someone asked, Can you recommend a good site? And I said, sure, let's go this. Hey, that's the name of my story. I found it by accident. And then after a couple of those, suddenly there was a pain story and then there was uh, an ebook and then there was a pain you know it was like, like a domino thing falling upwards was that like was it like okay. for you okay see the thing is you know the, the the publishing model it's kind of like a, it's kind of like the lottery situation you know there's a lot of writers that want to get published there are more writers than there are spaces to get published so sure. most magazines only publish you know a very rare percentage of their submissions you know some magazines have as low as one some lower than a one percent um like cosmic root and eldritch it has less than a one percent acceptance rate you know that's generally for everybody mm-hmm. you know now most of the magazines that you see out there have only a handful of um, Africans on them. I'm talking about a handful, like you can count them on the fingers of one hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so l- l- let's say you have a magazine that has less than 1% acceptance rates. Imagine that has hundreds of writers on it, but only a handful of you know, African writers, two, three, four, maybe one now basically you're having a frac it's already a fraction that gets into the magazine now the fraction that gets to be african it's now another small fraction so what you have is a fraction of a fraction jones that that's that's how you know <laughs> that's how it was for you know as an african writer trying to get into a top magazine like that you know so it's basically like having to be the one percent of the one percent you know I, I don't even know how you calculate that in, in in percentages you know so it's um and that hasn't changed if you go around look at all the top magazines 
that we all read, you're going to only see a handful of Africans on them. You know, no more than 10. You know, so yeah, yeah so it's uh, I've never as far as much as um, as well as you know, one might say I'm doing, I actually haven't been published in a lot of places. In fact, I could say that I haven't been published in. any of the prestigious magazines, you know, I, yeah, I recently got shortlisted. I was a finalist for the Nebula, BSFA, Locos, um, Otherwise Award, which I won, um, Sturgeon, for most of the prestigious magazines. The story that I got to be finalist in all those awards was self, was published in my anthology, you know, so basically, you know, you still have to create your own space, even now, between language barriers and, um, you know, and yeah. uh, everything else. So, yeah. Okay. So it, it hasn't so exactly you... been the you know, the steady climb, the upward climb. Yeah. The gradual climb, yeah. I see what you mean. Um, you know, okay. So what, what did it feel like to be nominated? And to be like, what happened when, when that happened? It was most of the awards I was nominated for. I was most if not all of them i'm the only person from where i am and i don't mean country like on the continent to have been nominated for those awards so it's a lot of it was unexpected you know sure. yeah. yeah it's like it's like i told you there are things that we didn't even dream about yeah. yeah and you know I think there's uh, I've had a, a few um, uh, a few different Af authors from Africa and they all say the same thing which is there is a great big um, people around Africa not just in your country are happy that you win that someone from Africa won it's not just that Nigerians would be happy that you won, but at yeah. least in, in, when they talked about it, uh, there's something yeah. pan-African about an African succeeding in, in this. Yes. Uh, did you experience that? So what, what was that? You said there's something... I'm saying, you know, that people from different countries are happy that someone from Africa won, yeah. not just... You know, just Nigerians being happy that a Nigerian won. Uh, at least in their yeah. cases, you know, talking about Zimbabwe and also Nigeria. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you experience that from people around uh, the continent? People happy for you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Of, of course. Um, a lot of, um, you know, yeah, we say Africa is not um, a country. You know, we have all these very diverse peoples, but the truth is that we share a lot of experiences, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there, there's a number of factors that forced us into, you know, similar boxes, similar conditions, economic factors, you know. It's like hunger feels the same every, everywhere to everyone, you know. Mm -hmm. um, cold, being cold feels the same way, you know, so... There's a lot of um, experiences that we share. So a, a lot of people can empathize, you know. A lot of people are faced with the same barriers. So, yeah, there's, it's, um, yeah, which, which is what fosters the shared celebration, you know, because we can understand, you know, 
on some yeah. level. Yeah. So I like to like we we're, we're getting long, so I want to get towards like I want to ask you a few questions toward the end. Um, can you okay. talk about the year's best uh, African speculative fiction? Okay. Well, um, when I started to become more conversant with um, the industry, because I had to learn the industry from top to bottom, you know, to break in, you know, so. I started to learn about Yes Best Anthology. Apparently, there's it, they're like a, a staple of the industry, you know. They're highly um, respected, you know. It's, it's a mark of, um, they draw attention to the stories that, you know, are considered um, spectacular or, you know, yeah. And, it's it's kind of like I told you. There's 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 a very um uh, what's the word? There's a there's a very huge scarcity of Africanness in SFF. You know, it's like there's there's something I usually say, SFF isn't local. You know, science fiction fantasy. It's not local. You know. It's it's only it's it's centered around you know this place. It's not diffused, you know, especially the community, the the fandom, you know. So it's kind of like how I mentioned that if you go around all the magazines, you're going to see very little to no African presence, you know. And I found that it's the same way with the year's best anthology. We're not, we're not getting published. We're not also getting our works recommended. You know, we're not, that's, that's also why we're not getting awards, you know? So yeah. it's, it's a, it's, it's like, a, it's a, it's a secular problem. And the solution has to be secular. You know, it's kind of like I told you, I, I, I came to publishing with this, aggressive um hype man you know rapper's hype man attitude you know but um not every writer can be that way or should be that way it's not even feasible it's not sustainable you know i can't do this continue so you know i basically feel like we have to build systems we have to build all these things that cater to or that create spaces for you know african writers so the year's best anthology is an attempt to to do that to create something that highlights stories by african writers published that need to be seen you know it's it, it's basically we're out of the loop in the um, general structures. So we have to build our own structures to basically fill in the gap. So that's what the year's best anthology is. Okay. And Dominion, an anthology of speculative fiction from Africa and the African diaspora. Yeah. Before Yes, Dominion is the same thing. It uh, was created out of a need to give voice to writers and narratives and stories that would normally not get published, you know. So, yeah, that's Dominion. Why is it called Dominion? Oh, well, um, it's... Um, Okay, that's actually my co-editor's um, doing. She came up with the title. So I think she can explain more about that. Actually, I'd like to talk to her as well. So maybe later you can. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I could recommend you. Or I could, yeah. I could send an email to her. I would love that. So how how were the two books received? Uh, well, um, I wouldn't want to brag, 
because I've been accused of that. No, you can brag. <laughs> brag. Go ahead. Which, which I might be guilty of being a rapper's hype man. I mean, that's what we do. So, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it's, um, Dominion has been hugely successful. Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's not like we, 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 didn't, we didn't end up on New York Times best sell, selling list. You know, we didn't get featured on um, any billboards, but um, I think that it achieved its purpose. It created a lot of visibility for, you know, African writers. A lot of people that hadn't been published, that hadn't sold stories before, ever mm -hmm. before got to be on the anthology. It had over a hundred reviews from most of the um, top reviewers in the industry. It was nominated for a number of awards, won some, you know, it, it, a lot of the works in the anthology were on year's best anthologies. As a matter of fact, the Locus um, end of the year review, Dominion was the anthology with the most works on the locals recommended reading list. So, you know, it, I'll say wow. it did hugely successful. Yeah. For a product, um, for a project that was crowdfunded and we had practically no budget for promotion. We did no paid ads, you know? So yeah, I think it did very well.